right, we're going to turn from math fundamentals to matter fundamentals now. Just a brief overview of a few things that should be foundational knowledge of matter and space. So the first thing to mention is space itself. Space is not matter, and in fact, space is nothing. And it's really clear, really important that we recognize that space is absolutely positively nothing, which leaves matter as the comprising fair characteristic of everything else. Since matter is everything else, it makes the most sense to start with some of the most basic knowledge, which is the fact that matter is considered to be comprised of atoms. Most of you by now should be familiar with atoms and comfortable with the components of atoms, but just as a primer overview, the atom is comprised of two basic structures, which is the nucleus, right? the first of which is the nucleus. The nucleus is a massive, dense center of the atom and carries a positive charge. In the center of the atom, this nucleus carries 99% of the mass of the atom itself. This is very important because if you think about it in terms of the particles, then the nucleus is comprised of two um, particles, protons, which are the positive characteristic, and neutrons, which are the neutral characteristic, usually drawn as three dots with no plus or minus sign. Since neutrons have no charge, protons are generally the particle of interest when you're taking chemistry class, right? They attract electrons in order to form molecules, and molecules form the fundamental components of everything else, right? Building up from there. Um, but what's most important in, in physics particularly is that they are 99% of the mass of the atom. So protons and neutrons are relatively large when it comes to particles in matter and in space around us, right? Um, because protons are the attractive characteristic that drives the formation of structure, we use protons to identify the type of atom, and so the number of protons determines what we call a particular atom. This is something that you should know by now based on this, which of course is the periodic table. The periodic table has organization based on the number of protons. So the number of protons in hydrogen is one, lithium is three, sodium is 11, and so on down the page, right? They run left to right in terms of numerical order, but they are organized according to characteristics vertically. That information is all things that you discuss in chemistry. The periodic table is only useful in physics as a source of recognizing the number of protons. This mass is an average of the mass of multiple isotopes of a particular atom and therefore is not something that would be used in physics. Um, more on that when we do a unit on fundamental characteristics and calculating binding energy. <clears throat> Since neutrons are neutral, right, they go along and they determine the different types of isotopes of a particular atom, but they do not change a particular atom. And so therefore, protons are usually the ones focused on in chemistry. In physics, we care about momentum and energy, and so of course the mass is probably the most important thing, and so there's an entire field of physics called nuclear physics, where we actually focus entirely on these particular particles, protons and neutrons, and completely ignore the other component of the atom. The other component of the atom, I'm sure you're aware, is called the electron cloud. Unfortunately, the electron cloud is a misnomer because it's not actually a cloud that um, indicates some sort of dispersal of particles around the central nucleus. And in fact, it's not really a dispersal. It's more of a probability of where the electrons are located. But because the electrons move within the uh, 
Electron Cloud at an extremely high speed, and they're very, very small. There is no definite position of an electron, and therefore we assume the characteristic to be a cloud. But there, the cloud is obviously external to the nucleus and contains all of the negatively charged particles, which we call electrons. Electrons are very, very small. In fact, 10,000 times smaller than protons and or neutrons, which is why electrons do not even get added when you consider the mass of the atom itself. They're very, 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 very small. However, because of their relative speed, if we were to think about the size of the atom once it's complete, right, with the nucleus and electrons flying around the outside, the, the volume of an atom is considered to be 99% electron cloud. Why that's important and what's probably most interesting to get your head around, since the electrons are 99% of the volume of the atom, but the electrons themselves are 10,000 times smaller than any given proton and neutron, and the protons and neutrons are tucked into the center of the atom, then 99% of the volume of an atom is actually nothing. Right? Space, of course, as we started, is nothing. So, <clears throat> an analogy I often use when I'm introducing this um, concept is to think about the electron cloud as a football stadium, right? You can all picture some large capacity stadiums like Ohio State, right? Ohio State is, is one of the larger football stadiums or down here in the south or Alabama, Roll Tides Stadium is very, very big, seats 100,000 people. If we imagine that the atom is the football stadium, right, this represents the overall volume that the atom takes up. However, the nucleus, which contains 99% of the overall mass, is a small, dense center way down here somewhere that contains the protons and neutrons. If we were to do it in comparison, the football stadium, the atom itself, in comparison to the protons and neutrons that make up nearly all of its mass, the football stadium here would be emptiness, and the center, which contains all the mass, would be roughly the size of a tennis ball, right? So kind of interesting to think about the fact that this small tennis ball inside of this space actually determines the mass of the entire atom itself. Then in comparison, since electrons are 10,000 times smaller than protons and neutrons, these protons and neutrons are humongous in comparison to the electron that is making up what we're calling the, the uh, electron cloud. So if we imagine that this is the size of a tennis ball containing possibly tens or even hundreds of protons and neutrons, then the electrons, which are out here, are 10,000 times smaller. So they're roughly the size of a grain of sand, right? filling this space. But of course they don't fill it, which is why cloud is a misnomer. They are in fact moving very, very fast at essentially the speed of light, almost the speed of light, but not quite. Since the electrons move around within the electron cloud, the analogy is simple. The tennis ball carries all the protons and neutrons and therefore holds the entire mass of the atom itself. The electrons on the outside, determine the volume of the space by moving, right? And so if you can picture that this tennis ball down here is attracting these electrons, but the electrons are moving very fast, they are moving from seat to seat to seat to seat to seat to seat all throughout the entire football stadium at speeds that are unimaginable, which is why if you look at it as a normal person, you can almost picture that the electrons are in all the seats and none of the seats all at the same time, which is why we think of it as a cloud. But that's the basic structure. And so if you can imagine that this determines the entire mass, and this is 10,000 times smaller than that, then the majority of the atom is actually nothing. Nevertheless, atoms are how we think about the universe 
in the world around us. And so there are a few fun facts that you should know. First of all, is that 90% of the universe, the entire universe itself, is comprised of one particular atom, which is hydrogen. 10%, the remaining 10% of the universe, is comprised of a secondary element called helium, both of which you should have heard of by now, right? This adds an interesting conundrum. If 90% of the universe is hydrogen and 10% of the universe is helium, that's 100%. And if we go back and look at the periodic table, there are 118 possible elements, and yet we've comprised the entire universe by hydrogen and helium. What would be the explanation for all the other elements? Well, significance determines all 118 elements. The massive amount of hydrogen and helium in the universe so greatly outweighs the remaining elements in the universe that when we're talking on a universal scale, we, we simply think of the universe being comprised of hydrogen and helium. And when you look at that, you think to yourself, well, Earth has a lot more elements than hydrogen and helium and certainly has mass that is determined by things other than hydrogen and helium. So where in the universe is all this hydrogen and helium? And the answer is pretty straightforward. Stars, right? Stars are the most abundant objects in the universe. And stars are preliminary precursors to the development of all other elements. And so in stars, due to reasons we will not get into, hydrogen and helium are formed, and then hydrogen and helium are used to then generate the remaining elements. Once a star supernovas, which is when a star uses up its fuel, burns out, and explodes, the, the supernova explodes those elements back out into the universe. They condense down into things like planets and moons and other objects. And so they are the, com the comprising material of the universe. And this should be fairly obvious because if you look up to the sky, the only thing that you can see at night, most of what you can see, are stars. If you were to focus a high-powered telescope at a blank black section of the sky at night, after some time that telescope would collect an image of billions of galaxies within that frame. And within those galaxies there are billions of stars. And so stars just greatly outnumber everything else around us. But of course here on Earth the elements end up being quite important, right? Elements are a collection of similar atoms. And are generally thought of as having exactly the same characteristics. This is how the periodic table is organized according to Mendeleev. There are generally 90 elements that occur in nature. Right? And so, as I said, there are uh, 118 possible, which means that the remaining ones are most likely man-made or highly radioactive and briefly created in stars as they burn through their material in order to create other stable elements. What's interesting about the universe and atoms and elements uh, for us here on Earth is that of these 118, only 90 occur in nature. And then here on Earth, there's only approximately 12 that make up 99% of Earth. And so we're really a small subsection of elements when it comes to our planet. And then even further, only five are in living beings. Since there are only five, it's a useful point to point out those five. Of course, oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen. And then the last one, if you think carefully about your own body, is calcium. 
these five elements form all living beings that you interact around us. Those five interact with seven more in order to create nearly the entire Earth. The entire Earth lives in a world, in a universe, where only 90 elements occur naturally, with a possible 118, and yet the universe itself relies mainly on two to drive the whole system. The universe is simple and yet complex.